Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley, our storyteller, and uh, today he's going to be telling us, a, a, I guess, a story out of his childhood, first of all. This is, it's a fascinating story, mostly circumspection, but with a wonderful touch of potential. Yeah, Mike, we go back a number of years, back to 1944. In the, in the summer of 1944, I'm 11 years old. And my Aunt Gay, who was a Barley and married into the Atwood family, travels to Kelowna. We'd just moved from the Golden City, old yeah, Rossland, Rossland yes. into Kelowna. And she came over to visit her brother, Billy Barley. And uh, he was a rancher here. And uh, so we decided to take a trip down into the Sinokameen Valley. I don't know why. She was visiting someone she knew down there. But that's 40-odd years ago, Mike. I can't remember who it was. But I do remember several things about that particular trip. We're traveling by car through, through, through Penticton, up into the Karameas Valley, and we're coming down into a little place called Olala. Somewhere around Olala, either just northeast of Olala or just west of Olala, I'm not sure. And my aunt makes kind of a curious remark. She says, you know, Bill, she said, over there, I think that's where the old Spanish mound used to be. And she points on the north side of the road and there was some open country on the north side of the road between Karameas Creek Draw mm -hmm. and Olala and right into Karameas. And I looked over there and I, so I, I, I inquired. I said, what, what about the Spanish Mound? And so she told me what she knew about the Spanish Mound. And really what it is, Mike, is a, is a legend in that part of the country, that specific part of British Columbia. And this legend has enough circumstan circumstantial evidence that I think it actually probably does exist because all this evidence has been found within a few miles of Karameas proper. So this is what we're going to investigate today, the legend of the Spanish Mount. Excellent. Right after this break, we embark on this uh, journey of surmise, but remarkable discovery. Don't go away. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley and the legend of the Spanish Mound today. Now, bring us along. The Spanish, of course, well-renowned for their search for gold sure. in the Western Hemisphere. The Spanish present in, uh, presence in both Central America and in North America is well-known. And the early successes of some of the conquistadors, Mike, such as Pizarro and so on, in uncovering literally tons and tons of gold in Peru and in Mexico proper, is, is quite well known. But there were other conquistadors who were, who were equally keen, uh, people like De Soto. And they were always searching for uh, a vague kind of legend. Either it was El Dorado or it was the seven cities of Cibola, the supposed seven golden cities of Cibola. And the Spanish mounted a number of expeditions to search for these fabled cities, which they believed existed. And one of these expeditions, I believe, Mike, Certainly, there's, there's, there's documentary information that the Spanish did discover and knew of the mouth of the Columbia. And according to Indian law and according to the evidence that we can piece together, and some of this is, is, is vague and some of it is legendary, and, and, and of course, we, uh, there's a certain amount of conjecture and, and speculation mm -hmm. in this. But we know that the Spanish did, did have ships at the mouth of the Columbia in the mid to late 1700s. And according to the, to the Indian lore, that the Spanish actually mounted an expedition there, probably around 1780 or 1790. And this expedition was a complete expedition. They were fully armed. They had coats of mail, which the Indians called metal, metal clothes. Mm -hmm. They probably had muskets. They had blacksmiths with them. They had horses, which was, again, absolutely traumatic for the Indians of the area. To see people riding animals they couldn't do because they only had dogs that were that were trained to mm -hmm. carry travois and so on but to actually see them riding animals dressed in dressed in metal clothes with a white face absolutely traumatic and so it was logical that they set out from the columbia for several reasons one it is one of the great rivers of the northwest coast secondly that columbia territory generally is open it is lightly treed 
It makes for easy traveling, especially if you're traveling by horse. So the, the, uh, the Spanish, the column, which may have numbered anywhere from probably 50 or 60 Spanish soldiers, complete with one of their leaders or two of their leaders. And they went inland up the Columbia, past the Great Down. And so they proceed up the Columbia, heading in kind of, a, kind of an easterly direction with a slightly northward trend. And the Great Bend on the Columbia, and then they come up the Columbia, and then they, for some reason, they take another river. They go directly north. Whether it was, whether the Indians directed them that way, because undoubtedly, Mike, they showed them gold that they had with them. This is what they were looking for. Stuff like, like this. Well, sure. Because the, the Spanish would probably wear some gold jewelry and gold necklaces. Now, Certainly. would the... Would the Indian people have had this kind of jewelry at the time? If there was gold there, surely the Indians would have been wearing gold jewelry. No, the Indians were not interested in gold. They were not interested in, in placer mining for gold. But they, they may or may not have known that it existed in the interior of British Columbia. We don't know that for sure. But we do know that the Spaniards, for some reason, took that Okanagan River and went up the Okanagan River almost to what is now the Canadian line or the border with Canada but not quite. And there another river came in from the west. And this the Indians called the Similkameen. And so they branched off onto that river, which looked like, well, it was a choice. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, kind of a Hodgson's choice. So they branched off onto that river, and unknowing to them, Mike, they walked right by Rich Bar, which we alluded to in another program at one time. And Rich Bar, of course, was a, was a famous placer mining area, but they weren't looking for that. They were looking for cities of gold, not placer diggings of gold. And then they came up past Rich Bar and came over what is now the present Canadian boundary, past an old rock called Speaking Rock, and up through that South Similkameen country, which is inhabited by the Similkameen Indians. And here we think, and again, again, this is speculation, we think that they, they captured some of the Similkameen Indians and used them as carriers. Now, sort of forced labor. These are the porters the undoubtedly helping out the soldiers who were probably suffering under their load. For of sure. It. For sure, Mike. And we think that there's some evidence of this because the Spanish were in the habit, were in the habit of chaining or roping, usually chaining their captives together and surrounding them with quadrupeds, which would be Spanish fighting dogs. And this was not unusual. It was known in Spanish America that they did this. Now, if you look at that Sinilcamine country, and I've, I've explored it quite well over the last several decades, and you have hundreds and hundreds of pictographs, Indian paintings but more correctly known as pictographs. All through that valley, right, right down from the pictograph stretch, which is just west of, old, west of Old Headley, right through other segments of the valley. But there's one painting that has always intrigued me, and it's generally known as the prisoner painting. And this particular painting, Mike, is, is really quite fascinating. Because what happens is, when you go up west of, a, of another rock in the Similkameen, which is Standing Rock, which mm -hmm. is just out west of Carameas, and you go towards Old Headley, and you come across an old field, and there's a field out there, and there used to be an Indian grave out there surrounded by pickets. Now it's still surrounded, but not the pickets have fallen down. And we used to go use that as kind of a marker. We, right opposite that, we'd go up the bank, cross the old great northern line, and continu continue right back towards the cliffs that sweep up for several hundreds of feet. This is mountain goat country. Yeah. It's really fascinating country. These granite cliffs go way up above you for hundreds of feet. And you go right along that granite wall until you come to a large covering rock. Now, this covering rock at one time, you can't see it from below. You literally can't see it. But when you get up on top of that rock, you can, you can envision the whole valley below you. You, can, you get the sweep of the valley. You get the Indian trail coming down through there, which was very easy to see from the top of the rock. And yet you can't see the rock itself. Now, yeah. that sounds odd, rather odd, but that's the way it works. And behind the rock is a natural cavity, almost a cavern. And in that rock cavern, right against the face of it, where you can see the old smoke from the, from the old fires that were lit, were lit by the Indians many, many centuries ago, you'll see two sets of pictographs. And these two sets of pictographs are absolutely fascinating. Now, in your book, Gold Creeks and Ghost Towns, yep. you've got a, a photograph reproduction yep. of them here. Yep. And this shows the prisoner painting. Yep. Now, describe to me what you find so fascinating about this prisoner painting. Okay. Now, out of, out of all the paintings, of the hundreds of paintings, this is the only painting that shows Indians. And Indians in the paintings are depicted without a hat. They have not got a brimmed hat. So these are definitely Indian figures. They are roped or chained together, all four of these, of, of these figures. And they are surrounded, Mike, by quadrupeds. There's no other pictograph or set of pictographs in the Similkameen or anywhere else in the interior that I know of that even comes close to this. 
And yet, and off to the side, off to the right-hand side, our left in the photograph, there are two mounted horsemen. And they are whites because they have brimmed hats. Now, that doesn't mean they're felt hats. It simply means they're whites. That's sort of the language of the Indian sure. pictograph is to have a brimmed hat indicating a indicating, white man. Yes, because the old high plain sign language was this for white men, yeah. brimmed hat. That could be a metal hat, it could be a, could be a Stetson, it could be a felt hat, it could be anything. But that indicates whites. And this is, I think, some very interesting circumstantial evidence, visual circumstantial yeah. evidence, that still exists that says, yes, the Indians did see these. And they, they put that down there for other generations to see. And it's, and it's specifically Spanish because of the rope from neck to neck. That was the tendency yeah. the Spanish had. The dogs is a yep. tendency for Spanish. That's the right. fact that these were Europeans is indicated because they were on horseback wearing brimmed right. hats. This is the first clue, but it isn't the last clue. Okay. So now we follow the story. We assume that they have captured some Indians. They probably maltreat them. The Spaniards were known for this, unfortunately, but at that particular time they were. And we, we think that an argument arose or a, or, a, or a fight arose between one of the captives and one of the Spaniards. And this soon, soon turned into a pitch battle, and the other Indians joined in. Well, they were fighting Spaniards probably with muskets, certainly with, with mail, and with horses, and uh, really the Indians couldn't match the Spaniards, probably because they, they couldn't overwhelm them. Technologically out, That's out, right. uh, out technological. Well, sure they were. Sure they were. And so the Spanish inflicted, according to the Indians, heavy losses on the Indians, and the, the Spanish then move up past Carameas, past Old Carameas, past Carameas Center, and up the valley of Carameas Creek, which swings off to kind of the northeast beyond Old Carameas, up through that dry country. And they're heading kind of in a northeasterly direction. And they go up to a little lake, which we call Yellow Lake now. They can't get through there because it's almost vertical. The cliffs are vertical in Yellow Lake. So they turn back. They come back about half a mile, and they discover a little creek. So they follow this creek. There's a little kind of a, a cleft in the hills there. Sort of the road up to Apex Mountain. That's the valley That's right there. That's right, up to Shingle Creek. So they go up They go up this creek, which is Carameas Creek, known as Carameas Creek now, and they go over the top, and down the other side, they hit another creek, which is called Shingle Creek. And they come down Shingle Creek, which is also fairly open country. They can do all this with horses, Mike. Yeah. And they come to a large flat. And there are two lakes. One is Skaha, mm -hmm. and the other is the lake the Indians called Okanagan. Okanagan. And they look... And they look northward, and they, and they examine both sides of this lake. And on the, on, the, on the east side, it looks easier traveling than on the west, because the west, the hills are more precipitous. Mm -hmm. So they go to the east, and they go through up along that east side, and they go through an old canyon, which we called Painted Canyon as kids. Now now is Wild Horse Canyon. because there Okanagan were Okanagan Mountain Park. Sure, Okanagan Mo Mountain Park. And there were wild horses in there even when we were kids. And they go through that, and they go over toward past Okanagan Mission and up into the, a great delta. And this is now the city of Kelowna, now Quaston, the Indians called it. They had camps there, and the camps were well back from the lake where it is today, because uh, that was swampy ground at that particular time. And they go up this delta until they find higher ground, and that's near the old Barley Stretch, actually. And they... People uh, are used to Kelowna, that's not far from where the Orchard Park shopping mall is today. That's right, okay. that's right. And what, what happens here, and again, we're theorizing a little bit, uh, what happens here... This is evidently the fall of that year, probably early fall. Mm -hmm. And they, they build a large stable, because in 1863, Mike, they found the remains of a large stable, which was about 40 feet by 75 feet. Huge, really quite huge. Probably would house several dozen horses, and possibly the men as well. And they found the remains of this, and yet the Hudson's Bay Company had no record of a building of that size yeah. in the Kelowna area, nor did the Northwest Company, nor any of the other free trading companies. So that was put there prior to their coming into this country. So we don't know. We have to assume that another group of whites, because this, all this was log work. It would have been fashioned with iron axes. They do know that, the first people who saw this. So we assume that the Spaniards stayed there over the winter. And it may have been an easy winter. It may have been a very difficult winter. But according to the Indians and according to those, those stories that filter back over the centuries, that they, the Spaniards were decimated either by disease probably by disease, yeah. I would imagine, or possibly by hostility from the local Indians. I would think disease would be the more logical one of the two. Yeah. Associated with cold, associated right. with poor food, everything. That's right. And okay. finally they realized after this, after this winter, which is a horrendous winter evidently, that they're not going to find the seven cities of Cibola, that El Dorado is not in the Okanagan Valley. Yeah. And so they decide to return, and the numbers are now 
heavily decimated. We think there were probably 20 or just over 20 Spaniards left, maybe 25. But they, they follow the same route back. So they go back down along the Okanagan Valley on the east side, down again through Wild Horse Canyon, down through the Penticton area, where there's a, at that time, even then, there would be a large Indian camp. And the Indians are now tracking them. They have long memory. And, uh, <laughs> and these Spaniards and, were not pleasant and, people. <laughs> that's right. And the Similkameens want their revenge. So they go up, they go up Shingle Creek, they go up over the top, they come down to the bottom of Karameas Creek as it enters out into the valley. And there's a little flat in there, Mike, which is a logical camping place. Now, I've combed that flat, and I haven't found any evidence of the Spaniards, but of course, that would have taken place probably 200 years ago. Yeah. But evidently, they camped there before they entered the valley, the, the valley of the Similkameen proper. And the Indians then got together all the Similkameen braves, as well as a number of Okanagan Indians, and they prepared a great ambush. And the Indians, of course, knew this country like the back of their hand. And the ambush was incredibly successful. First of all, there are probably only a dozen, two dozen Spaniards, right? Yeah. Probably at maximum. They have got their muskets, but they may be in low on ammunition. They have got their metal clothes or their armor or their yeah. mail. That's true. They probably have some of their horses, at least. And the Indians, we think, numbered over 200. So it was an onslaught. It was a massacre. It was a slaughter. Not one Spaniard survives. And according to the Indians, they wiped them out to the last man. And then they took some of the weaponry, some of the weaponry, and some of the trinkets the Spaniards had. Yeah. And, and so they... But then they took the Spanish, all the bodies, and also some of the weaponry, such as the mail and so on, yeah. and they buried them in a Spanish mound. Now, precisely where the Spanish mound is, Mike, I don't know. You'll talk to people in Carameas, and I've talked to old-timers who have been there for 50, 60, 70 years. Some people say, Bill, it was just south of Carameas. Some people say, Bill, it was just west of Carameas, you know, between Carameas and, and Ashnola Gap, or between Carameas and, and Standing Rock. And yeah. other people say, well, no, it was south, between here and, and Speaking Rock. And but I think, I think that that Spanish mound is somewhere between where Karameas Creek comes right into the valley, just about three or four miles northeast of Olala, mm -hmm. and Karameas itself, the present site of Karameas. And we have, we have evidence there, which is really quite remarkable, which states that indeed somewhere in this area, there still stands an old mound that contains the remains and the armor of the Spanish. Take a break here. Come back in just a second, because as I say, most of what we're talking about is supposition. Where's the evidence for it? It's in the next segment. Don't go away. Take a break. Be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns, talking about the legend of the Spanish Mound. So what evidence do you have that this actually occurred? This is so much speculation. To a degree, Mike, but there is some very compelling evidence. And one piece is right there in your hand. In 1940, a man called Reg Atkinson is excavating a burial, an Indian burial in Okanagan Falls. Now, this is no longer allowed by the laws of British Columbia, but at that time it was. It was accepted. And out of that burial, he gets a number of things, including one piece of turquoise the only known piece of turquoise. This turquoise pendant is the only one that has been identified and documented as being found in an Indian burial, an old Indian burial in Okanagan Falls, which was just a few miles away from the site of the massacre. Okay, so if this had been a standard part of uh, native Indian uh, ornament, it would, it would be all over found the all over the place. This came from Spanish America. It came from Arizona or it came from New Mexico or Mexico. No doubt about it. This is, and so this, you perceive this was taken from one of the Spanish who died, and it was handed generation to generation and found in that burial. That's one of the other pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that helped fill it, fit it together, Mike. No 1940, that yep. took place. Now, 1950. Family in the Carameas area has lived there for years and years. They've been there for decades. This is the Parsons family, the late, late Doug Parsons and Bert Parsons. And, and they came across some Indian items that had been buried in an old burial at Clawson, which is just south of Carameas, on a rock slide burial, which is marked by, by sofa lally sticks. And somebody went in there and excavated this. Parsons family fortunately picked up some of the artifacts. And these are some of the artifacts right ahead of you, Mike. Now, this is just amazing. And why it's so important. We do have uh, the occasional metal artifacts found in Indian burials, occasional ones. But in this area, 
These are not tools. The ones you find are tools. Either they're knives or they're axes or something like that. These are weapons. And this is iron, and this would be what, a spear That'd point? Be a spear point, right? A spear point. Yep. And this one here, type this of is... halberd. That's a type of Spanish weapon as well. And this one, this looks, look, you can see the design work. Sure. And you can... Oh, yeah. And this would have been... Uh... And there's, there's, no, there's no use for that for the Indians. So I think this came from the original lost Spanish column that was eventually decimated by the Indians. Because, as you say, some of the uh, weaponry was taken That's right. and distributed amongst the That's native right. people. Yep. And it would have been a precious thing to be buried with oh, one sure. of the leaders. Sure. And so this was found in that burial. That's right. Kept as a ceremonial piece, not as a working, not as a working tool. Quite decayed, too, because it was made out of iron. That's right. But and these were not made out of iron. That's right. Those are quite important. Those are wrist, wristbands, actually, made out of copper. And along with these, in the same burial, Mike, we get these. Now, this is very interesting. These are copper, heavy copper plates, which are perforated, so they'd overlap like this. So this is the armor. This is the armor, and there are eight pieces of this. So this covers all the chest. Now, where did the Indians get the idea of armor? Well, I think they got it from the Spaniards. It's the only piece of metal armor found in southern British Columbia. And As so this, again, is some of the booty taken after the massacre of the Spanish column. I, I think so. I think so, because it's, it's well done. You'll see that they folded in the edges on this, and uh, it's, 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 it's really quite well done by, by a good blacksmith. So, really, the whole story that you've put together is uh, how logically could Spanish artifacts get to the Similkameen Valley? Not just that. We have the pictograph, we have the turquoise, we have the weaponry, we have the mail, we have the, the old building in Kelowna, the, the remains of the old building discovered there in 1863. We have the ability of the local Indians to, 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 to formulate the letter R and to pronounce it accurately, which other Indians in the area can't. So there's a lot of kind of circumstantial evidence that I think is, is almost overwhelming. Where have you experienced some interest in this story? Well, actually, a number of people, a number of archaeologists have phoned me about it. In fact, just about two weeks ago, the Spanish consulate in Vancouver phoned me about it and went over my, my information and my notes. And uh, they, were, they were quite interested and, uh, and are actually sending in some scholars to, to study it. So, all of the story aside, I mean, it's all possible and plausible that the Spanish came up the Columbia, yeah. turned north on the Okanagan, north on the Similkameen in search of El Dorado, the Cibola. seven cities of Cibola. Yeah probably irritated the native people a great yep. deal, couldn't survive the interior cold and harshness, right. exited, were massacred, and the discovery of these artifacts in the graves is evidence of their presence. This is the hard evidence. We have visual evidence and hard evidence. What we don't have, because these were taken from Indian burial yep. sites, is we still have not identified where the natives buried the Spanish conquistadors. I think it's between Carameas today and the mouth of Karameas Creek, which is three miles northeast of the old village of Olala. Fascinating story. You can put it together. The uh, Spanish Mound on Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. See you next time.